Thank you so much for coming out tonight uh, to hear more about Coquitlam's strategic transportation plan and reimagining Coquitlam's transportation future. Uh, my name is Doug McLeod. I'm the Director of Transportation. I'll be your MC tonight. We acknowledge uh, with gratitude and respect that the name Coquitlam was derived from the Hanakamitnam word Quiquitlam, meaning redfish up the river. The city is honored to be located on the Quiquitlam traditional and ancestral lands, including those parts that were historically shared with the Katsi and other Coast Salish people. And I'm really uh, relatively new to Coquitlam and really humbled that Coquitlam is named after a traditional um, word. I believe that's a very great tie-in to the First Nations uh, reconciliation. So tonight, we're going to be using something called Slido. So who here knows what Slido is? Perfect, so some of you do. For those who don't, it's going to be an online tool that we use to help uh, moderate questions, and it's going to be the way that we can interact with um, the, the speakers tonight, the panelists, and ask questions and learn more. So we encourage you either to use your smartphones right now and scan the QR code, which will give you a link to Slido, or go to slido.com. And once you get there, you're going to enter in the, the code word, uh, pound CQ transportation, and that's going to be your access to all of the ability to ask questions tonight. And you'll hear more from me later on on this. Why we're here tonight. Transportation impacts everybody. Everybody transported themselves to get here tonight, right? So transportation is fundamental to how we move and how cities operate and, and successful cities operate. And it impacts your safety, how you get around, your perceived safety, your real safety. It impacts the climate action and the environment, um, your public health and how healthy a city can be and how self healthy the individuals in the city can be. Importantly, it impacts the equity and diversity. A good transportation system can be accessible for all users and all ages and abilities. And it's also not just about moving people, it's about moving goods because that helps you get a thriving economy. So we're here tonight to bring in a bunch of panelists that we're very pleased that they've taken the time to come in and take the time and have a conversation around this um, to have a different perspective on reimagining the future of transportation in Coquitlam. So, told you once about Slido, so now we're going to do a test. So for, for those new newbies, here we go. Join, please join Slido now, and we're going to ask the first question, get ourselves all warmed up and seeing how we're using this uh, Slido technology, all right? And again, if, you, if, if we're going too fast, that information is available in your pamphlets and brochures that you received on your way in. So the first question is, how did you get here today? We just want to know simply, how did you get here? You're going to see once you log in and you get into the website, you're going to see a bunch of options. And these should be the options that you see. All you have to do is pick one or more. If you were multimodal, which is great, pick all the modes that you use to get here. OK, so right now it's 54% walking, 32% car driver, 27% SkyTrain, 19% micromobility, 4% bus, 4% car share. So I'd love to see the diversity of uses, especially the high amount of walking here. That is fantastic. So now a little bit next more complicated question is, what do you like most about transportation and moving around in Coquitlam? So we're looking for like a short phrase, one word. Um, Slido even has the ability to use emojis. So if you're like, you really want to go down and use the emoji path, feel free to use that as well. Um, and then we'll get a, well, I guess we'll have to talk about the word cloud that we get out of this. So. All right, so right now the, the responses are predominantly SkyTrain, which is fantastic. Then we're seeing multimodal, trails, West Coast Express, walkable, urban nature interface, which is a, definitely a thing of, uh, that Kukulam takes a lot of pride on, uh, hiking, parks, trees, paths, all fantastic answers. All right, so 
keep, keep that in mind because we're going to be using that throughout the evening. Please feel free to input your questions. If you do not have Slido available, um, there'll be two people coming around handing out piece of papers. Just put up your hand and they'll come and grab you a piece of paper and we'll write that um, on, on the piece of paper and put it into Slido. Uh, so right now, I'd like to make sure and introduce our, a little bit of background on the strategic transportation plan. Uh, so please welcome to the stage Glenn Chow, our transportation planning specialist, and Tom Thivener, our transportation planning manager, who will teach you a little bit more about where we are at the current state of our strategic transportation plan. So my name is Glenn Chow. I'm, I'm the project lead for the strategic trans transportation plan, which will guide the priorities for the city's uh, transp multimodal transportation network over the next 25 years. Current version of the transportation plan uh, was last um, updated in 2012, and since then, lots of changes have taken place in the city. Uh, that includes the arrival of the SkyTrain in 26, uh, 2016, uh, lots of growth and development around the city. Uh, the city also adopted an environmental uh, sustainab sustainability plan last year that um, set uh, greenhouse gas reduction uh, targets. Uh, there's also been changing demographics uh, with a growing proportion of seniors, for example. And the city also has a gr growing emphasis on equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives. There's also been a lot of new and emerging mobility trends, uh, including uh, we see more uh, e-bikes, e-scooters, uh, increasing popularity of electric vehicles, as well as uh, uh, updates to best practices in street design and transportation engineering. Uh, last year as well, TransLink uh, adopted its regional transportation strategy, Transport 2050, and as a city, we want to be integrated and aligned with them. So the strategic transition plan has five phases. It launched on Canada Day last year. And the first two phases really focused on uh, getting a detailed understanding of the city's uh, transportation system, including the challenges and opportunities. And currently we're in phase three, the visioning phase, where we've developed a draft vision, goals, and key teams. And uh, Tom will be sharing more about that in a bit. And in later phases, uh, we'll be uh, developing long-term transportation network uh, plans, policies and actions, and then prioritizing them based on short, medium, and long-term timeframes, and also developing a monitoring plan. Uh, we are targeting to finalize the new uh, transportation plan by middle of next year. And this will also integrate to uh, other ongoing projects, uh, the uh, e-mobility strategy and the road safety strategy. And you'll hear more, uh, more about the road safety strategy from one of, the uh, one of the panelists tonight as well. So re recapping some of the key insights from our engagement in the first two phases, uh, we engaged over 1,500 participants, including with uh, advisory committees, uh, equity deserving groups such as the uh, visually impaired persons and the uh, recent immigrants. And a few of the key takeaways uh, we had were that a variety of transportation modes were used to get around the city, and there's a need for transportation planning to uh, accommodate the diversity of uh, backgrounds and experiences, such as uh, there's differences in physical abilities and also social economic backgrounds. And um, some of the concerns we heard related to the uh, lack of a safe uh, facilities for walking and cycling, uh, a desire for more frequent and reliable public transit services, as well as uh, high transportation costs, especially for the lower income uh, groups. And late last year as well, the city conducted a household travel survey. Uh, this is a statistically valid survey. Uh, that looked at, uh, or rather sought to understand how, when, where, and why Coquitlam residents were using our transportation system. And uh, based on this survey, uh, we saw that 22% uh, of all trips were made by sustainable transportation modes. Uh, so sustainable transportation modes would include walking, cycling, micromobility, and uh, public transit. And over the years, while there has been progress increasing this sustainable transportation mode share, the pace isn't fast enough for the city to meet its uh, uh, 2012 transportation plan target of having 30% uh, sustainable mode share by year 2031. 
And in the survey as well, we looked at uh, the geographic variation in the uh, sustainable mode share across different sub areas in the city. And here we see that um, around the SkyTrain stations in city center in Burquitlam, uh, the sustainable mode share is around 30%, much higher than the, uh, the rest of the city. And this really reflects the benefits of uh, transit-oriented development where you have uh, much uh, access to much uh, faster and frequent uh, public transit services. And so on our project engagement website at uh, letstalkcoquitlam.ca slash transportation plan, we have an interactive survey data visualization tool if you want to dig further into the survey uh, data um, and explore uh, all the findings. And uh, with that, I'll pass it over to uh, Thomas. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'm Tom Thivener. I've been uh, the Transportation Planning Manager for about uh, nine months, and it's my honor to work on this project and make Coquitlam a better, more livable community. Uh, so, given everything that we've heard uh, from Glenn about the Phase 1, Phase 2 engagement and lessons learned, our proposed vision for this transportation plan is that in 2050, Coquitlam is a complete and connected community that prioritizes the sustainable movement of people and goods to support a thriving economy, healthy environment, and equitable society with accessible, safe, and reliable transportation options for all. To meet this vision, we must have measurable goals. By 2050, we are aiming towards a 50% mode share. This includes trips on foot, bike, other forms of micromobility, such as e-scooters and public transit. We also need to aim for zero greenhouse gases coming from the transportation sector. And we need to aim for our system of streets to be safer by reducing serious traffic injuries and fatalities down to zero. A 50% sustainable mode share target is important because Coquillum is gonna continue to grow. Much of that growth will be in higher density neighborhood centers, and near SkyTrain stations. Driving will still be an option, especially for longer distance trips. However, transit will need, and, and transit will need to carry a larger share of trips in the future. For shorter trips though, we think walking and micromobility need to increase substantially. While electric vehicles will help us reduce our greenhouse gases, they are not considered a sustainable transportation mode. They're still cars, and if we carry on as that with the business as usual approach, BAU on the slide, we will generate 120,000 more new vehicle, vehicle trips, almost 50% more than, than today, and we're not sure that we can handle that type of growth uh, on our streets alone. A 50% sustainable mode share also means that we will keep vehicle trips roughly the same as today and shift our new, new people and residents to the sustainable modes of transportation. So as we move into the planning phase of the project, our vision and goals lead us to these five themes. Safety and accessibility for all, complete and connected communities, sustainable and innovative mobility, reliable transportation network, and fast and frequent transit. Today we hope to better understand what potential actions might result from our expert panel that'll work their way into the STP, the revised plan. Before I introduce our moderator for this evening, using the Slido app again, can you tell us which transportation modes you wish to see, you wish to use more of in the future in Coquitlam? But anyways, this is really just to give us a snapshot on uh, and what people want to see more of in the future. And it looks like micromobility, including e-bikes and e-scooters, is taking the cake, followed by more walking, and taking more transit, especially SkyTrain. That seems to be popular. Okay, great. So let's move on to the expert panel. And our moderator for this evening's panel event is Dale Bracewell, Principal of Mobility Foresight. Over to you, Dale. Yeah, a round of applause for Glenn and uh, Thomas, if you like. Yeah. 
so yeah, so good evening. Um, I'll be your moderator for the evening. My name uh, is Dale, and, and it really is a joy uh, to be here. I have a, a, a deep passion for transportation. It's kind of been what I've been doing all my career, and these uh, processes of like a strategic transportation plan, they're not like once in a lifetime, but they're at least once in a decade plus, and so I'm really glad that you're here uh, engaging with the city of Coquitlam and, and participating in this evening. And as you can see, even by your, your Slido, um, you're, you're obviously welcoming uh, SkyTrain, thinking about that as part of your future. Uh, the team has been sharing, you know, a land, the land use plan for Coquitlam. It's a, thankfully a large part of the growth is going to still be in and around the walkable distance of, of those SkyTrain stations. And, and, and staff, I can just say, like, as, as your moderator, like, they've done a, a great job kind of explaining to council this opportunity, the vision that's um, in front of you. Uh, and the canvas is there. And so the part that's missing now is, is beginning tonight and with people doing surveys is you, you the public getting engaged, uh, providing your feedback, is this the right vision uh, for, for the city of Coquitlam? And so um, tonight is an opportunity for you to feel like, okay, I wanna feel like that I'm confident that the city can actually achieve those three, they're bold, uh, but they're possible goals. And, and the panelists that I'll introduce uh, in a moment, one by one, are really to help you um, they're going to give different perspectives, but ultimately kind of give you some of the ideas of strategies, tools, and things that are going to need to be kind of talked about when uh, the next phases of planning and implementation come for, for the overall uh, process. So again, be thinking now about the future of mobility and thinking about the context of this being your, your community. So um, as per the, the slide here, um, we're just going to go in the order. Um, and the bios, by the way, if you didn't pick up, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, um, are on the, the handout sheet that was uh, at the front, and if you needed to grab one uh, now or later. And so yeah, we'll, we'll go with Megan, Gina, Tyler, and Sandra. And each of them will be presenting for just about um, eight minutes, and then we'll keep transitioning. And then we're going to go to this uh, Q&A. So I'll just remind you again, for those that have a phone, you can actually start putting in your questions as the panelists speak. And then again, there's a couple of staff um, that if you put your hand up and you want to uh, have a question written, that can be added um, to, to it as well. So are we ready? Are we ready to hear from our panelists? I can see a nod. See, see, that's great. Awesome. Um, so first, I'd like to up, uh, invite uh, Dr. Megan Winters. Uh, so uh, Megan is a professor at uh, SFU in uh, health uh, science. And believe me, she knows a little bit about active travel and what's healthy for us. And I've had the privilege when uh, previously at the city of Vancouver being a, a partner along with, with Megan in terms of the work that she does, and it's fantastic. Uh, so please join me in a round of applause for Dr. Megan Winters. Thank you for the kind invitation. Oh, there I am. So I want to start by letting you know that I'm from Coquitlam. I was raised in Coquitlam. I went to Parkland, then I went to Como Lake, and I'm a centennial grad. So for 20, 20 odd years, I lived in Coquitlam, and my father's here. They now live in Newport Village, and my sister-in-law in Burke Mountain. So I'm very familiar uh, with the, the spaces you're in. Um, 25 years ago when I was in Coquitlam, things looked different than they do now, and I'm excited to talk about what it's going to look like or what it's going to take to get us to the place we need to be 25 years from now. I'm an epidemiologist or a population health researcher. Um, the starting point for sort of how I do my work between health and city design is that health begins where we live, work, learn, and play. That decides what we're exposed to, what opportunities we have, uh, what positive and negative health, health environments we're raised in. And that transportation is really the backbone of the city. So transportation and land use are integrated, and it's transportation that lets people get to the places they want to go, the opportunities they need to get to. Not everybody has the same choices. Not everybody can drive. Not everybody can walk. Not everybody can bike. Not everybody can optimize on what they would like to do for most of their trips. And uh, the Slido helped us see what you saw. So we're talking about oh, Quitlam's um, strategic transportation plan which has been introduced. These are great goals that they've put forward. They're lined up with what the regions put in place and what we need to have in light of climate change pressures we're under, in light of congestion pressures we're under. And so Coquitlam, Coquitlam I would say, is, is on board. This is a good set of goals that they've put forward. 
Um, I've lived here. I know Coquitlam has hills. That's part of it. It's got great green space. It's got great hills. Um, I know that because of the shape of Coquitlam, you know, where it is, it's butted against other municipalities. There's highways and arterials running through it. Um, this is the thoroughfare for a lot of the traffic, and that's one of the challenges here. It's also true that certain areas of Coquitlam have great access to SkyTrain uh, and are close to West Coast Express, and so those rapid transportation lines are in place. But I think from the work that Coquitlam's done in the mobility snapshot, the feedback we've gotten, and I'm sure your experience is that a lot of areas of Coquitlam currently lack the infrastructure that we need to invite most people to feel comfortable walking, cycling, and using public transportation. And that's sort of why we're here and what I'll reflect on. I'm gonna put some challenges on the table. Um, so this slide has been introduced by the city. I'm gonna give you my flavor on it, or what I saw when I was preparing for it. So. The data says that at this point, 22% of the trips are made by walking and micromobility is inclusive of cycling here in transit. So as was introduced, here's where we are on the existing, the, the, on the far side. I uh, shaded out the business as usual case because I'm gonna say it's not an option on the table. So that doesn't fit with any of the goals of our future. Um, but what I wanna really draw, what I saw in here and to draw your attention to is that the future scenario the goal with 50% by active modes also means that we just have about the same numbers of trips by motor vehicles as we have right now. So that's the same number of cars moving around even as people move here. And to me that means that's how much road space we get for motor vehicles. That means that all the growth that we need to be planning for is growth that supports trips by walking, cycling, and transit, and that's where our emphasis needs to be in all of our planning decisions, because this model says this is the same number of trips happening by motor vehicles as happens right now. So that stood out for me a lot. Um, and I'd say it's gonna take a transformational change to be able to get that kind of growth happening, but there's uh, actions in place and you're doing the right thing now to plan for it. When uh, the consultation happened, these are charts that came from the report of what we heard, so this is from Coquitlam residents, and like in cities across the country, what the major barriers were for people walking and cycling were about safety, so they were about speeds, motor vehicle volumes, and they were a lack of infrastructure for walking and cycling. So Coquitlam is commenting on the same things as people elsewhere. And so I just wanna dive into the cycling or micromobility a little bit. Um, Coquitlam has, while it has 117 kilometers of cycling infrastructure, um, only a third of it is the kind of infrastructure that people would consider comfortable for most. So in the planning world, one of the words that you'll hear people talk about often is all ages and abilities. So planning for all different kinds of people who might choose to walk or cycle. And that sort of building facilities that you see on this side, facilities that are separated from traffic. Most people don't feel comfortable cycling on a painted bike lane or cycling alongside motor vehicles. And in Coquitlam, in the recent data, it's 80% of trips that are made by men. Okay, our population isn't even gender split. So this is obviously telling you that there's people who are not invited to make these kinds of trips. They don't feel comfortable making these kinds of trips. And until we see more as equal spread in that, we're not meeting the target on providing facilities for all. Um, so to meet a, that kind of bold goal, 50% of trips by active and public transportation, I told you there's evidence, there's strategies, there's ways to get there. This is sort of a framing I would suggest to keep in mind as you go forward. It comes from cycling, but it would work as well in, act, in walking or in public transportation. Um, it's like not everybody's the same, so in thinking about how to get more people doing this, just remembering to segment that there's different kinds of people. One of the goals is to get new people walking, cycling, and using public transit, and thinking about the strategies that work for that. But some people are already doing these things, but maybe not for all of their trips, and you want to make sure that you're also building in strategies so they can do this for more trips. Maybe they were using active modes to get to work, but not for shopping. What can you do in order to invite them to make those trips for shopping? And then we've all been through life stages where everything changes and is upended. You've had a child, you've moved, you have a new job, and you've retired. Making sure that people have, can continue to make choices that would support active mode. So just thinking about these different stages um, is something that can be overlooked. I've got three, 
I don't know, principles, things to pay attention to. The first one, key points I want you to hear is that it's speed that kills. One thing that I haven't seen enough of yet in the commentary is about speeds and speed limits, and at the end of the day, speed is the thing that matters. So I did hear the public, I did read that the public were concerned about motor vehicle speeds. This is sort of a classic figure cited everywhere in various forms. What it's telling you is that if a person is hit by someone driving, so if a person is walking and they're hit by someone driving, if that car was going 30 kilometers an hour, that person walking has 95% chance of survival. If the car was going 60, 65 kilometers an hour, that person's got a 15% chance of survival, okay? So speed is everything here, and having reducing speed limits is politically challenging, absolutely, but an utterly important thing if you wanna ensure that people feel safe and comfortable walking, cycling, and using transit. A second part is that design matters. So this is two figures that I've put up here. Um, sort of speaking to equality versus equity. The point I want you to take home is that design matters and it's felt differently by different kinds of people. So encouraging Coquitlam to really make connections to different kinds of users and user groups and to know that one single gap in that network, whether it's a curb ramp for somebody in a mobility device or whether it's one segment of a road where you just hoped people could get by is enough to make it not possible for people to walk or cycle for that trip. My third point is that space is limited, and I think this picture says it more clearly than I could explain it. So thinking back to what I said about the road space and what it's currently used for in Coquitlam right now, this is this kind of space that we allocate, or a visualization of the kind of space that we give to people walking or people cycling. And if we're gonna shift the paradigm so these modes are priorities, so we have all that growth happening, well then, that's where we need to be putting the space that we have on our roads. It's limited in every city and it's limited in Coquitlam, but we're gonna to have to shift the allocation of space so there's space for people walking and cycling, there's space, space for people using e-bikes and e-scooters, um, and not making them more space for motor vehicles. So uh, th the city staff, put up these, uh, the themes, there were five of them. I think three of them in particular really speak to what I think is important sort of for what I've spoken about um, success, about safety and accessibility for all, and so that's making sure that it's planned for people of all ages and abilities, thinking about design, and remembering about the, that it's people walking and cycling who carry that burden of the road, road violence that happens. It's about building complete and connected communities throughout the city of Coquitlam, so making sure that everybody's got access to the kinds of amenities they might need and could do that by walking or micromobility or transit. And it's about sustainable and innovative mobility. So one of them is making sure there's, I haven't really talked about it too much, but really an improved transit network, um, making sure that those trans, that there's access and storage for cycling and walking, or for micromobility at those transit stations. Um, I mentioned the hills in Coquitlam, they're there. The technology solutions are really coming forward to us and I can't underscore sort of enough the growth that I see in e-bikes and e-scooters in the city of Vancouver and across the region as well and that these are a real solution for a place like Coquitlam. It's gonna be really important to have places to store them at the SkyTrain stations um, or to enable and make sure and talk to TransLink to make sure those kinds of things can be linkages because there are some long distances in Coquitlam and there are hills in Coquitlam. We're in a really positive funding environment for transportation and mobility uh, in terms of climate and in terms of active transportation. So continuing to make sure that those dollars flow into Coquitlam to make things happen. I want to encourage Coquitlam to continue to look at targeted initiatives. So the data would say that only a quarter of the trips are for commuting, so for work travel. And we need to plan for all the kinds of trips that people need to make. So really thinking about supporting schools, school travel, school streets around those, making sure especially that those speed limit zones happen around schools and around community centers so that people can feel comfortable making those trips, walking and cycling, and don't need to drive. And then I think a lot of attention, and this takes leadership to parking, parking costs and charges, to speed limits and to road space priorities. Those are tricky political environments and it'll be important to have that as part of this um, strategic transportation plan so that people can continue to cite those as priorities and why they're making the decisions that they do, especially when it comes up against challenges going forward. 
So I started with 25 years ago, it felt really different here. Right now we're planning for 2050, and kids like these will be adults in 2050, they'll be middle-aged adults by 2050, and what we're doing right now is shaping the plan so that they can keep walking in those, walking and getting around the cities as they grow. Thank you. Thank you, Megan and Gina, if you uh, don't mind coming up. So Gina Hortolano is the uh, Director of Program and Services. Um, she works in your uh, community, so this is fantastic, at the uh, Share Family and Community Services where they offer all sorts of different types of mobility support. Um, this is going to be very insightful because uh, Gina works with families, um, works with seniors, individuals who are, you know, be engaged and, and getting social uh, support. So um, welcome Gina and we look forward to uh, your insights here this evening. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on where we gather is a traditional and unceded territory of the Kikwitlam First Nation people. As Dale mentioned, my name is Gina Hortilano and I'm with SHARE Family and Community Services. I'd like to introduce um, SHARE quickly to you. SHARE is a nonprofit agency that is based in Tri-Cities and is focused on serving the Tri-Cities residents. It is a multi-service agency as we serve children, youth, adults, seniors, and families, including immigrants and refugees. The programs that I oversee um, include our food bank, subsidized housing, and senior services. It is in our senior services that we have a program called Better at Home, where we offer transportation to, um, to medical appointment so seniors can live at home independently as long as they can. A few years ago, we also um, offered a program called Seniors on the Move, where we supported seniors with accessing different transportation options. In all the focus groups and community needs assessment surveys that we have done, especially among seniors, transportation is, always comes up as a, one of the most needed services. And it is always equ equated with the need to stay connected in the community, to reduce isolation, and preserve independence. When it comes to getting around, what we've heard from individuals and families attending our programs is that walking is the most preferred option whenever possible, even if that means pushing a stroller, pushing a walker uphill. However, they've also mentioned uh, specific challenges that make walking difficult for them, and that includes an even and narrow sidewalks. Not having enough benches or rest areas along the way. And also, curves are not smooth and so unsafe, especially for people who are using um, a walker or scooter or a wheelchair. And then we've also heard that when walking is not possible, public transit is the next option. But again, they've mentioned specific things that make taking public transit difficult for them. And that include no shelter at bus stops, not having access to a washroom along the way, even at sky train stations, and that bus routes are not direct. We had a, a, a senior in the, in the program from Kukitlam who needed to go to a specialist appointment outside of the Tri-Cities. Her appointment was for one hour, uh, from 12 until 1. She left her home at 9 o'clock in the morning, got to her appointment at 11, 11.30. For her way home, she left her appointment, uh, appointment place at 1.30 and got home at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. She shared that when she got home, she promised herself not to do that again, even if it would mean not seeing her specialist again. SkyTrain may seem more efficient, but again, when the elevator is not working, people on wheelchair, those pushing a walker or a scooter, can get stuck. We've also heard from a lot of people that public transit is expensive. At the food bank, we would get calls from community residents who would say, I'm phoning because I'm trying to make a decision and I'm feeling quite unsure and probably you can help me. I'm out of food. I only have $10. I'm trying to make a decision whether to use my $10 to get some food or get bus tickets and go to your location and pick up some food. So as a service provider, we have seen how transportation costs can increase the, the food insecurity that families are experiencing. 
Even before COVID hit, many seniors were using online shopping due to transportation challenges. And online shopping can, can, be more, can be very convenient, but again, it also limits the options that the person has in terms of where, the, where she, they can get the food, or they can end up get paying more for the food, and or not getting the most culturally appropriate food that they want. We have also seen how, the, due to the lack of uh, appropriate transportation, how people, uh, vulnerable people, especially seniors, are not able to access healthcare or other needed services, which could result in isolation or, again, diminished well-being. We have also seen how individuals and families who are low income actually could end up paying more for transportation. For, for one, people who are low income are, live, uh, are forced to live in the outskirts where less expensive housing may be available. And that would mean longer commute and paying up to three zone bus fares. Many of us immigrants or refugees are finding ourselves in this kind of difficult situation. The 2021 census would show that in Metro Vancouver, the number of newcomers who rely on the public, uh, on the public transport is increasing. So to be able to support vulnerable groups and to have inclusive and healthy communities, transportation systems need to be accessible, affordable, and appropriate. In addition to improving sidewalks, curbs, facilities, to, be, to, to have the transportation more accessible, it is also important to engage diverse groups in activities like accessibility audits so they can provide input. It is also helpful to provide opportunities to residents to gain more experience about how to use the public transit. Because mind you, understanding bus routes, understanding the fare zones, and even just learning how to get a ticket from a machine can be a big learning curve. To make transportation affordable is, of course, make public transit fares low. And there's also a need to expand transportation subsidy program, like the Taxi Saver program and the, and the Transit Pass um, for low-income and middle-income renters. And of course, there's a need to make, to make bus routes more, more direct to reduce tra travel time. To make transportation more appropriate, there's a need to increase transportation options. And it's important also to support community-based transportation services. And again, engage people with lived experience in decision-making processes. In closing, I just would like to reiterate that accessible, affordable, appropriate, appropriate transportation systems are needed. So community members are able to attain increased social and economic participation, stronger community connection, and independence, and ultimately enhanced well-being. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, my colleague, uh, Tyler Golly. I've known Tyler uh, for a long time, uh, another professional engineer, now a very uh, highly esteemed road safety uh, professional, uh, well done. Um, and I'd say, uh, as I know Tyler, he's been uh, one of those who's been perfecting uh, the art and the craft of good people-friendly uh, street design. And so now he's going to be bringing um, a, a kind of safe systems approach, so he'll elaborate um, on that. And if you want to talk Lego with Tyler, that's okay, but that'll have to be after 9 o'clock. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we look forward to uh, your presentation, Tyler. Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, my, my job, I guess I've been hired by the city of Coquitlam along with my colleague Ryan Martinson who's way at the back uh, to help them develop a road safety strategy for the city and it works together with the strategic transportation plan which you all have been uh, hearing about so far um, and there's been lots of engagement on that already. Um, but I wanted to start with this term called the road toll. Uh, Ryan and I were doing some work in New Zealand and we came across this term in a meeting and we thought it meant the toll that you would pay if you were traveling on a road. Um, we, we have those around, there's some in Vancouver area, um, but it quickly became evident that no, no, the road toll in New Zealand is actually a term related to the number of people that die on the roads every year. And that really shook me because um, it, it really 
fought against my principles and values that as we travel, we shouldn't have to die or experience life-altering injuries. Um, in, in Canada, um, on average, five people die every single day. So those are our friends, our family, our coworkers. Um, and another 22 people are getting seriously injured. In Coquitlam, the numbers are a little bit different. If you change every day with every year, that's kind of what the numbers are like here. And there's another about, call it, I'm rounding here, but four to 500 people also being injured, maybe not seriously, but, but injured, and those can still be life altering. And how we got here is relying on uh, what I'll call the traditional road safety uh, approach. And this approach focused on all crashes. There was a lot of emphasis about the road user, so us as we travel being responsible for safety. And there was a lot of focus in terms of actions on education and enforcement. Um, and in many times, safety was optimized um, after decisions had been made uh, about the road system or the transportation system, um, maybe perhaps prioritizing speed or a vehicle mobility. And so what happens is that actually the foundation of this traditional approach is, is faulty, it's cracking, there's something wrong. And so what the industry is doing and what we're looking at here in Coquitlam is, is a different paradigm, and I'm going to explain with the rest of my time here, uh, which pairs Vision Zero with, roads, uh, with the safe system approach. So Vision Zero uh, doesn't accept a road toll. In fact, the, the philosophy of Vision Zero is that road fatalities and serious injuries uh, can be and should be eliminated uh, while providing safe, healthy, and equitable mobility for all road users. And this is coming from the Transportation Association of Canada, their definitions. So how do we achieve that goal of Vision Zero? Uh, we do it by applying what's called the safe system approach. And this is an integrated and comprehensive process um, that really focuses on making sure that we, we allow for errors to happen, because all of us aren't uh, perfect. Um, my mom thinks I am, but I think you know, we can all agree that that's not true. Um, and that we should focus on eliminating predictable and preventable serious injuries. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because uh, Dr. Winters has shared some of this, as well as Glenn and Tom, but Coquitlam's strategic transportation plan and our road safety strategy has this draft target where uh, it is a vision zero target. It's zero fatal and serious injuries by 2050. And that's supported by a theme which is talking about safety and accessibility for all. And the other panelists have talked a lot about this. So what I wanna share for the rest of my time is what is that foundation of the safe system approach and what makes it different? The first thing is that we all make mistakes when we're traveling. If we're driving, as an example, there's a lot of things coming at us that we have to try to pay attention to and process as we're traveling. And it's very difficult to be perfect. We will make mistakes. Um, and we need to make sure that when we design our transportation system, that we allow for those mistakes to happen in a way that won't result in, in death and serious injuries. And in fact, a study was done that said, what if we all were perfect? What if we were all... Um, chat GPT, but in like robot forum or something. And it found actually that even if we were all perfect and followed the rules explicitly as they were written, we would still have fatalities and serious injuries. Yes, we would reduce them. 60% of fatal fatalities would be reduced and 40% of serious injuries, but they still would be there. And so again, we have to make sure that we design our transportation system to accommodate these errors that are unintentional, the ones that we just, we make when we travel, not trying to misbehave, but when there is a bad apple and there is intentional misbehavior, um, that is where enforcement can really help us out to try to deal with that. And the things of, in, in terms of intentional misbehavior that, that I'm referring to, it's things like speeding, excessive speeding, uh, distraction, and uh, impairment. Now another big part of the foundation is that crashes are both predictable and preventable. Um, in many, many ways, with the traditional approach, it was like we were playing whack-a-mole. A crash would happen, we'd jump out there, try to solve it, and then another one would happen somewhere else, and we'd try to solve that. And it felt like it was very um, by chance, and that we couldn't really get ahead of the game. With a safe system approach, what we actually want to do is we want to not just look at where the crashes are happening, but understand more what are the underlying risks at those locations, and where within in this case, the city of Coquitlam, are those same risks present, but a crash, a fatal crash has not happened. And the reason that that's really important is that, uh, for instance, in Montreal, they looked at the location of all fatal and serious injury crashes in that city, and 80% of them, 
happened at locations um, where there had never been one before. So they, it appears to be prob probabilistic or really by random chance, but if you look at the underlying factors, um, the same risks that are happening at those locations are also in lots of other locations within the city. And so you need to take this um, proactive approach by using different tools that we're going to be deploying here, looking at crash data as well as the risks. Another part of the foundation is that um, our bodies as humans are vulnerable. Uh, Ryan likes to use this phrase that physics is a thing. If you remember back to your school days, kinetic energy has mass and, and velocity. And um, Dr. Winters talked a, lot, uh, a, a bit about this as well, that speed is, is pretty critical. If you're driving and you're hit, uh, say you're making a left turn, if that oncoming vehicle is traveling at 50 kilometers per hour, there's a chance that you're going to be seriously hurt and potentially killed. And that's even with you being wrapped in a metal um, object, as well as having seat belts and airbags and other safety devices within your vehicle. If you're walking, um, the risk to you is even higher. And, um, and if you're an older adult or a child, that 30 kilometers an hour that some people are striving to is to say that's a safe speed is actually even less than that because children's heads are really low, um, seniors, were, our, our bodies continue to get more vulnerable with time. So, um, so when we look at speed, and, and Dr. Winters, as usual, nailed it, speed is the largest risk factor when it comes to road safety, and it's the most important one that we need to regulate. So it's going to be pretty critical for the road safety strategy if we're going to try to reduce the harm here in the community. But you can't do it alone. Um, it's not just about speed. There's a bunch of other things, too, that we want to, want to and need to do. And so the safe system approach includes, um, it kind of organizes itself around these six elements. Safe speed is in there, but there's also, um, we will be having actions related to safe road users, safe vehicles, safe road design, um, post-crash care. So what happens if you do get hurt uh, or in a crash, you still need that care. And, and one that's recently emerged is safe land use planning. And that's about travel planning, and, and the other speakers have talked a lot about this, and, um, and Glenn and Tom did as well. And so what those overlapping measures allow us to do is that it takes out different risks within the transportation system, within the travel, so that that little arrow at the, at the left-hand side there, um, as that hits us, uh, or right-hand side, I guess, for you, um, it's, it's moving. It's so slow that even if we do still get into a crash, it's not going to result in serious and fatal um, consequences. For all this to work, the last part of the foundation is that we need to work together. The city of Coquitlam can't do this alone. The, even with their partners with the Ministry of Transportation or um, Fire and Emergency Rescue Services or the police service, um, they also need us to help. But that doesn't mean that we, the public, the traveling public, need to bear all the responsibility. Um, under the safe system approach, it, it looks at shared responsibility. And so what that means is that um, the, the the designers, the, the providers, the, the folks that own and operate and maintain the transportation system, they have a responsibility to make sure that that system's safe. And then us as travelers, we have a responsibility to try to follow the rules and, and not make mistakes. But if, if we do happen to make a mistake, the responsibility then falls back to the system providers, so the city, the ministry, others, to make sure that that mistake did not result in a serious or fatal injury. And to wrap up, this is really important. So I think you maybe were expecting me to tell you this, the specific actions we might be taking. Um, but I, I'm not going to do that because um, we're still looking through the crash data. But importantly, crash data can sometimes have lots of gaps in it around risks. And you folks live here. I don't. I live in Edmonton. Um, but you, you live here, you're ex experts in your community, and through your lived experience, there's risks in the city that you can t tell us and share with us. We know through the previous phases of engagement, you've shared a lot, and safety seems to be a very important concern for the community. But right now, there's a, a mapping survey online asso associated with the Strategic Transportation Plan, and in there, you can tell us the types of risks that you're experiencing and where they're located. And that's going to help us a lot to create a plan that's actually tailored to Coquitlam to solve the issues here. So thank you so much. Thank you, Tyler. And I'd like to invite up uh, Sandra Phillips. Uh, Sandra is the shared mobility architect and founder of uh, MoveMe. And it's, uh, it's, we're really fortunate. Uh, Cassandra uh, is really one of the leading pioneers of sh shared mobility, and she's local to our, our, our region, and that is fantastic. 
and she definitely knows about shared mobility, but also kind of how that helps uh, people live, you know, with less car dependency within the context of, of living in a community like uh, Coquitlam. So please uh, join me in welcoming Sandra, your final panelist for the evening. Thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation. Um, I had a chance to take the West Coast Express out, of, out here. One of my favorite modes is a train. So um, I will be guiding you through three topics that I've been working on for the last 13 years uh, here in the region, but internationally. Um, and that is micromobility, uh, car share, and then mobility hubs where you co-locate these new forms with public transport. Um, just to get the definition out of the way, we've been talking a lot about micromobility and people seem to be really excited, but what exactly is it? Um, it's a category of small one person electric vehicles. So anything in color on this image is a micromobility vehicle. So it can be an e-bike, it can be an electric cargo bike, it can be a moped. I've seen a number of scooters while I walked around Lafarge Lake today. They can be used privately. I hear your mayor really likes to get around on an e-bike, but they can also be in a shared system, uh, like bike sharing. Um, we have a number in the region, or I should say in the city of Vancouver, North Van, um, Richmond, not yet in Coquitlam. Why is micromobility important? There's a lot of reasons. I'm gonna pick out two. Um, the first one, it's a lot more affordable than an electric vehicle. An electric car is about 65,000, um, and e-bike is a lot cheaper. And if you're in the market for an e-bike, uh, BC has just announced a new e-bike uh, purchase rebate program, and you can apply starting tomorrow. Um, but it also expands who can ride, when they can ride, and where they can ride. Um, obviously, you have a lot of hills, so you appreciate the fact that an e-bike makes it all easier, or even in a scooter, um, to get up all of these hills. But it also expands the season of uh, active transportation or cycling. Um, we have looked at the data from Mobi, which is the bike share in Vancouver, and specifically at their e-bikes. They got introduced last summer, just before the winter season started, when they normally have a drop. And especially on the outskirts, uh, between half to three quarter of all trips have been e-bikes, so they expand, extended the seasonality. Um, plus, it expands who can ride. Um, if you're young, a young adult, not yet having a driver's license, all of a sudden you can get around uh, further. Um, if you're an aging uh, or an older adult that still wants to be active, you all of a sudden have more options to get around. Now, does it work in Coquitlam? Well, I've learned that 40% of trips are less than five kilometers. Actually, this is very similar in most cities I've worked in. Um, and 65% of trips are under 10 kilometers. So if you live in River Springs, you want to get um, to downtown Coquitlam, that's a trip that you can do. Um, or if you want to get to Monday Park, well, how long would that take you on an e-bike? First one under 15 minutes, second one under 30 minutes. So it's definitely doable. Now, what is needed? Um, we've heard some of this before. Protected micromobility lanes. So we talked about AAA cycling lanes. What has been increasingly happening is the e-bikes, specifically e-cargo bikes, are wider. Um, so how do you accommodate for that? How do you accommodate for people on electric um, cycles that are potentially faster, quieter, essentially widening um, the designs or, or making them micromobility lanes, um, micromobility hubs at SkyTrain station or public transit stations. This picture actually is not from the metro uh, Vancouver region. It's one of the first micromobility hubs that I know of. It's from my old hometown. I grew up in Switzerland. Uh, this is from Zurich. Swiss people like to organize things very neatly, so they put the scooters and the bikes uh, right next to the trains. Um, train, uh, the main train station. Um, and then uh, collaborate with shared mobility providers specifically to increase affordable um, options uh, so that it's also affordable for young families to use bike share um, or scooter share or... Um. Now the second topic I want to touch on is car sharing. 
Um, again, car sharing offers members on-demand access to vehicles only when they need it and if they need it, and they only pay for the time they're using it. Um, car share organizations normally take care of what I call ownership headaches, um, insurance, gas, parking, maintenance. We actually, in Metro Vancouver, we actually have the largest car share fleet in North America. Um, it's about 3,000 vehicles altogether. You have three providers, Modo, Evo, and Turo, two of which are in Coquitlam available. So Modo and Turo you have here too. What are the benefits and, or why is car sharing important? Again, there's lots of reasons. I'm gonna pick out a few. Um, the first one is one car share vehicle replaces between five to 11 vehicles. There have been numerous studies. Car share is one of the oldest shared mobility forms. There have been numerous studies on this um, and they all confirm the range is different or the number is different depending on, on the region. Members also drive less. Uh, part of that is because they're on the clock and they pay for every minute they're driving, so they're thinking twice whether or not they go and pick up you know, a, a carton of eggs around the block or if they walk. Um, can car share work in Coquitlam? Yes, absolutely. In fact, you have 17 motor vehicles already and two tour vehicles. What does it take to make it more uh, successful? Really proximity to vehicle stations and more vehicle available. Um, if you had a car share vehicle every 500 meters, why would you need your own car? And if it was available when you need it. Now, that's where I would say, if you want more, go and ask for more. Modo is a cooperative, very much based on input. So if there is, if you ask, they will come, essentially. The last topic I want to touch on is what mobility hubs and stations. The image actually explains it quite, quite well. You essentially would get off a bus or a SkyTrain. You would have a car, bike share, scooter share, or scooter stations, um, and potentially even an electric car share, all closely co-located. Um, this really helps, because I mentioned before, one car share vehicle replaces between five to 11 uh, personally owned cars. Each one of them, so that also means you don't need to build parking for all of these vehicles. In Coquitlam, there has been a study that one saved parking spot saves about $17,000. It also means you can unbundle parking from housing costs. So make it more affordable for people, um, for housing for people. Again, can you work in Coquitlam? Actually, you do have some of this um, already. There are very many neighborhood uh, mobility stations. So if you know the union, uh, it has one car share vehicle in the building, two in walking distance, and uh, a SkyTrain station just across the street. And if you're in the union, uh, the car share operator also offers free membership and drive time to use it. Um, you also have two SkyTrain uh, stations that have uh, car share vehicles parked right outside. So why is shared mobility so important? We talked about this at the very beginning. Uh, Dr. Megan Winter mentioned this as well. It's about space. So you can use all the space for cars, um, for parking or for moving it, or you can use the space for whatever else your community needs. Thank you. and uh, we're just gonna have our panelists um, come to the front. We're gonna switch into some uh, Q&A. So this is your prompt to still, if you have access there to the Slido, you can still uh, either add some questions. Uh, there's staff again, if you just need to write it out and hand it to them. Uh, you can also, if you're on Slido, uh, rank uh, some questions. The staff will kind of curate them. Um, we can see that not all the questions are maybe directly related to the panelists and uh, we're working out so that some of the city of Coquitlam staff will be able to try and answer some questions. We won't get through them all, but we're going to do our best. And if it's okay with you, we're going to actually go with the Q&A all the way to 8.30 and then have some closing remarks if, if you do need to leave. Um, but just with a little bit of technical issues, we want to respect that you've come here and, and maximize a good hour and a half um, with you. Um, I'm going to get us going with a couple of questions, and I just thought uh, for the panelists, you know, 
thank you very much um, for each uh, round of applause for our panelists. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I mean, Gina, you, you had mentioned shopping, which kind of got me thinking about it. Um, there was a couple references to e-cargo bikes and entirely clearly from a safety perspective. I'm thinking goods movement. Uh, you saw uh, Thomas said, you know, it, it's, this is a 2050 goal um, regarding moving uh, people and goods. So I just thought, you know, maybe again, from each of your different perspectives, you know, something uh, that you'd want to share as it relates to, to that part of the, the future of, of moving goods in Coquitlam. Megan, did you want to start? And maybe we can go, yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. So, great question, and I'm happy to have it. You know, my take on goods movement, which I think of a lot of the time, is that there's more people who are gonna be living in Coquitlam in the coming decades. More people means we need more goods movement, means that road space is needed to keep that good movement happening. So, if anything, it's motivation to do harder work to get people out of their cars and making trips, walking and transport, walking and using public transport and biking, because we need the road space for the goods movement to happen. I like it when I see a prioritization that explicitly puts walking and cycling first, public transit in place, but that prioritizes goods movement distinctly from private motor vehicle use, because that is what we need to make sure to keep our economy going and keep things moving. If I may add, um, I think moving goods, we, that is an area where we need to find more efficiency um, and also make it least expensive because you can just imagine that it's, the cost will be passed on to the regular, you know, individual consumer. And we've, we saw that somehow during COVID where the supply of food became so uncertain and how the, you know, the anxiety, the uncertainties that it created. But at the same time, there has to be a bigger goal that the, 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 the transportation, the, um, how to call that, the distance should, should reduce also. Like me, producing what we need, I think that's, that's the key. So the transportation can somehow become a secondary point. Thank you. Um, when we were looking at Coquitlam and writing our proposal, actually, Coquitlam, I mean, it's got a, um, a significant history in, in goods movement, right? You got waterways here, historic railways that, that really shaped travel and transport, including goods movement. Um, what I'm most interested in, I think what the STP as well as the road safety strategy needs to reflect is how goods movement is continuing to evolve. A lot of us are now buying things online and having delivery so that urban goods movement is changing. Um, some of the, the, the providers and courier services that we're seeing deliver goods are changing the way that they're moving. They're moving from larger trucks into distribution into smaller vehicles and sometimes even cargo bikes. So. Um, when we look at our transportation system, we need to be thinking about how those modes of goods movement are changing um, and what is needed and focusing and prioritizing the streets um, that are meant for goods movement to, to move them, um, but also making sure that we're still protecting, I think, and, and supporting our communities to be what we all need them to be. Um, so I think a lot of the big change I'm seeing in the industry is looking at curbside management. And so you can get those deliveries um, and saving some curbside for that, but also making sure that the design of those delivery zones are safe um, so that people walking can still get through and that they're accessible. Maybe just to add kind of our perspective, um, on the micromobility side specifically, we've seen an overlap also between the shared use and then the logistic use um, because they're smaller vehicles, they're really nimble and useful in, uh, for neighborhoods for the last mile essentially. Um, so I think that's a really interesting aspect where micromobility has a real big role to play I think in the future. And then the second point, maybe to make is that's also where electrifying essentially the fleet, the fleets, the logistics fleets is um, perhaps easier than transitioning everybody who has a car to an electric car. Hey, thank you uh, panelists. 
Uh, the, the, the second and last question I have before we get to audience Q&A is there was clearly a bit of a theme on some road space you know, reallocation um, as being how we would start seeing, I guess, the future of Coquitlam in terms of achieving uh, the goals. And, and yet, at the beginning, it, you know, it was recognized that right now Coquitlam's not on track even for its 20, um, you know, 31 target. So thinking of like the pace of change and towards more people-friendly streets, like any, any thoughts of what we need to be kind of getting ready for in Coquitlam? Any benchmarks of other cities or examples that you want to kind of illustrate or bring insights to? But just I think we're, we're trying to, I think, as a community, think, well, what kind of pace of change um, are we going to need to expect to see? It's, it's still a 30-year plan, um, but I'm picturing, at least from your presentations, quite a bit of a transformation in, in quite a few streets. And if any, anything you wanted to share kind of holistically at, at a systems level. Yeah. Megan wants to go first. I'd say I'm a, yeah. I'm a first go. Okay, I'll give it to you first. Maybe we need to be a French-speaking city. The two cities that I think are standout, one of them is Paris, so that's fine. You can tell me it's European, it's different than us, it doesn't fit our model, we can't do it. The second one I'm going to tell you is just go watch Montreal. So the pace mm -hmm. of change in Montreal for reallocating road space, for putting priorities in place, and Montreal is not a small city. Montreal is two million plus people, it's boroughs, it includes suburbs, it has complicated jurisdictions. It is building infrastructure for walking, cycling, and public transit out into surrounding neighborhoods through AXIS, so through the REV program. And so I think it's really the one to watch with, with over the past five years, just incessant sort of investment and commitment, political commitment to building out what they know needs to happen if they're gonna keep their region moving. Anyone else want to share in terms of pace of change? Gina? Yeah. I just want to add, um, in, in terms of changes, I think we can look at the population, uh, foresee what are the changes that, you know, may be happening in the next few years. One of that is age, like it's an aging population, and I think that's not one thing that needs to be considered when, when planning infrastructure. Although we can say that, you know, the seniors now and the seniors 10 years from now will be it will be, I mean, that senior seniors from now will be more technolo technologically savvy, but still there are limitations and restrictions that the, that the population will have. Another um, change, I think, is the movement. Again, it's very related to the housing situation. The people, the farther people go, the more transportation needs we will have. So hopefully we can have more people who will live and work where they, where they play or like basically where we will have more people where they live, where they work. So that's just the goal. Yeah, Go okay, ahead. okay. <laughs> um, mine's not necessarily a, a city, but I, I think uh, it's more maybe a, a heads up. And as a community, you're gonna be going, going through a lot of change together. And I think it's about, um, for, for me, I think the reflection would be about how to work together and to be honest with one another, there will most likely be missteps along the way. And so how do you learn from those together, um, being kind to one another and learning from that so that you can continue to evolve and make what um, the changes you need to make here uh, work for here. Um, so it's more, it's more about that, working together and, and knowing that there will be some missteps probably, but you can, you can correct those missteps together. I'm not going to pick a specific city, even though I like um, Paris and what they've done quite a lot, also <laughs> from the shared mobility side, but um, I will actually pick a time uh, in recent <laughs> years that we all know, where we all of a sudden were able to change quite quickly also the road space, and that's when the pandemic happened, and all of a sudden we had to figure out how to give each other more space, um, like pedestrians, so we could line up. And that was possible. So what I'm trying to say is like, we actually have some experience from recent years how to do that. So if we could take this forward when we implement this plan, or if you can take this forward when you implement this plan, I think that would be um, probably setting the pace to get to where you want to get to. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so we wanna now turn uh, over to questions from you, um, the audience. And so I think actually this is kind of showing you at least some of the, the highest ranked ones, but I think 
uh, team, I think we're going to now just show maybe the, the one question, and, or should I just read the one from the top? Perfect. Okay. So here we go. Um, and I guess panelists, the, the, the questions generally don't necessarily have a name attached to it, so I'll, I'll leave it. Not everyone needs to answer, but um, uh, anyone who would like to contribute. So e-scooters are very fast, and there are no helmet regulations, and there are no restrictions um, on, I guess, access to roads, sidewalks, and bike lanes. A fall from an e-scooter or a collision with a pedestrian can result in a serious injury. Has this been taken into um, consideration? Maybe, maybe, Tyler, you would start. Sounds like mostly a safety question. Um. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, when I said that we, we use crash data to do some prediction, um, one of the gaps in crash data it, typically is that they only involve motor vehicles. So that's police reported crashes or re uh, crashes that are through ICBC. Um, they almost always require a motor vehicle to be involved. And so that's actually one of the things we're hoping you can help us out with. There are, other, are some other sources of data that we're looking at uh, from Hub and some others um, that have some of this information, but it is difficult to get. Um, the City of Vancouver has been fairly successful in working with the health um, authority there to have access to hospitalization data, and that's another place you can get um, information related to non-motor vehicle involved crashes. So, in this example, e-scooters with a pedestrian. Um, so we are seeking out that information and um, working with the city and others to try to, to glean that. But again, um, also, if you've experienced this, these locations, um, they tend to be on narrow sidewalks in my experience. And so understanding the locations of those uh, would be really important for us to understand. And we're hoping you can share that with us. Yeah, Megan? Um, uh, so, I agree. I'm involved in some of these research studies that are looking at uh, people who arrive at hospitals and have been injured in e-scooters, and thus far, I will say, the numbers are still very low. So relative to sort of the motor vehicle injuries and deaths and fatalities that we see, there's still extremely low numbers of e-scooter users. I think the like, perception and experience of them is one that's you know, commonly scary. They could be whizzing by you on the sidewalk, they come up on you quietly, it makes you feel uncertain and uh, prone to falling. Um, when people talk about this, uh, transport people who's, who are in cities with large numbers of e-scooter users on them, I think that the major point to take home is that if they have a place to be on the road, that is not the sidewalk, they will use that place to be on the road that is not the sidewalk. And so it gets back to that choice we make about how we use road space. So if they have a place to go on the road that's suitable for something going at that vehicle speed that doesn't have a metal case around it, then they won't be on the sidewalks in our locations. And sidewalks have bumps, they're actually really uncomfortable on, on an e-scooter as well. I mean, they want to be on some smooth pavement. So it's about providing for these kinds of road users that are coming our way that are sustainable and healthy modes and making sure that we have a plan for them in our spaces. And maybe one thing to add from my world, the shared world specifically, it's actually a huge topic and one of the things that the majority of the private riders have implemented is geofencing technology where a vehicle one of their scooters would slow down if it gets into a zone that it has been, mm -hmm. you know, identified as potentially a conflict zone, they can slow it down, they can slow it down to a halt. Now it has to be in a shared system, obviously not every single scooter that you buy off Amazon will have this technology, but it is a consideration for sure. Great, great, thank you. Uh, I think we'll just move on to the next question, which um, is safety-wise, uh, there are many studies and practices used across the world. Some of them are more complicated to implement and some of them less. How do we plan on leveraging these? Tyler, please. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. There, there's a few fairly well-established ones. Uh, Vision Zero, I mean, started in Sweden in the early 90s. Uh, sustainable safety in Holland or the Netherlands started a, a few years after that. Um, and the safe system approach actually in Canada has been around for quite some time with the Transportation Association of Canada. The, the trick has been um, in terms of how that's implemented and the decisions that people make and how they prioritize those decisions. Um, and so what we're seeing in the industry is that these models that you're, um, you, you may be experienced, whoever asked the question, um, they can be quite complicated, but the best ones are, um, are based on some fairly foundational 
items and philosophy. Some of those things I shared, the foundation, let's say, system is kind of galvanizing or summarizing those uh, across these different approaches around the world. Um, and then the other part of it is actually very contextual to the community. Um, I'm actually currently in a course with the University in Delft, and some of my classmates are actually from Africa, and their experiences and their issues in, in some of these African cities and some of the Asian cities of my classmates are very different than what uh, I'm working in and experiencing in North America. And so we need to tailor our approaches to the local, and that's where the analysis of crashes as well as the lived experience that you'll you're all going to share with us, um, I'm sure. Um, and even the information that you, you and your neighbors and others have shared through service requests, we're also looking at that. And that's helping us understand the specific issues that are present here. And uh, we will tailor the approach to address those. Go ahead. I want to know if it's uh, complicated in terms of engineering or complicated politically. Because I think we know what the evidence is that you would do, which is, I said speed kills, speed kills. This is the problem at hand on many of our arterial roads. It's convenient for us to get to work faster when we're driving, but it's the thing that's causing a problem here, and it's politically complicated. But from an engineering perspective, engineering enforcement, it's not complicated to slow down the cars. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so, Next question team is, I'll assume it's the one at the top, is the city urban planning aligned to the transportation plans? Might be a staff related question here. Any insights into what is planned as short and long term initiatives around urban planning, i.e., um, for example, replace parking lots in the center of the city with facilities encouraging walking? Doug. OK, yes, thank you. So. Um, Yes, there are definitely plans. <laughs> to the, uh, there is a city center land use plan that has uh, the potential to uh, transform the entire city center into a high density transit oriented development. Um, of course, many of those private parking lots are, are owned by private entities and develop under their own market conditions. So that's not something that the city can guide. What really the city does is helps help identify and designate those land uses that can then lead to a path that is enabling developers and understanding that, hey, this is where we want to see this additional growth that encourages highly walkable, highly micromobility, and high transit access. So these plans are very much in line, and so you're, you're seeing some of that already in the Broquitlam low heat area plan and the Broquitlam city center plan. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for the adaptability as well. And uh, next question then is based specifically on your background in academic study of public health, Megan, which segments of the Coquitlam population do you think are most detrimentally underrepresented in the data that has defined this STP so far? Aside from seeking their engagement, how can we account for their needs? Okay. So um, I want to tell you first that the city did something amazing by running their own household transportation survey. So most cities don't have rich population representative data that's current um, and instead rely on five-year-old data from TransLink. So like, it's the good on them for going out to get that kind of data to bring into it as well as their consultation efforts. And I think that's excellent. Um, I think it's more the lens that you want to take. So engagement, yes, but you said aside from engagement, so what would I say? I would say that the young and the old are often left out, maybe especially the young are often left out of these kinds of thoughts. And the young are the people who are going to be here decades from now when this, transfer, when this plan comes into play. The key thing that I think is a shift, needs to be a shift from conventional thinking, is there's a traditional focus on commute trips, peak commute times. And commuting is only 25% of the trips that people were making in Coquitlam during this household transportation survey. So what about the rest of those trips? And I'd say typically we pay less attention to those, but they may be shorter, they may be around mobilities of care, they may have different needs, they may be at different times of the day. And so I would just encourage to keep thinking about a broader sense of transportation and mobility needs, a more diversity of the places people need to go as they're thinking about how to move the the transportation plan forward. Thank you, Megan. Um, next is 
Uh, I don't own a car and I'm an older adult. I live in the city center and rely on walking, SkyTrain and transit. We need more trees and vegetation for shade along streets to facilitate walking in hot weather and help mitigate and adapt to climate change. We also need public transit, tr public transit access to every park and trail. So not necessarily a question in there, but does anyone want to kind of comment, I uh, think about the um, desired aspiration here for really more, I'll call it green infrastructure, and I think part of the people friendliness of streets and actually recognizing climate change, which wasn't talked about too much, and, and, and the relationship to transit as well. I can take a stab at it. So in addition to safety, no, I'm kidding. Um, I, I do a lot of stuff with transportation, but um, one of the things that is really interesting when cities go through this exercise that you're going through is that um, actions that you take to make your city more climate resilient and safer and more livable also make it safer. And so th that's partially why we're doing the road safety strategy at the same time as the strategic transportation plan um, and looking at your micromobility network and all these other things um, is because they work together things like, it's called co-benefits in the, in the jargon in my industry. Um, and that's really important. And, and this aspect of, of this, this story reminds me of a, of a story that was shared with me um, by Tamika Butler, who I used to work with. And she shared this story about, um, uh, she was looking at working in LA, and um, there was this one intersection where people kept getting hit and they couldn't figure it out. They tried to do different things with the traffic signals, they tried to do other things, they finally went out there and started to talk to people. And what they realized was, on one side of the street was a bus stop with no trees, and Los Angeles is pretty hot, and on the other side of the street, mid-block, was the single tree on the entire block. So people were waiting underneath that one tree, under the shade, and when they saw their bus coming, because it didn't come that often, they would run across the street and they would get hit. And it was near the intersection, but not quite at the intersection. And so that, that's a story that really struck me because it showed the importance of thinking holistically and working with urban designers, working with um, landscape architects to try to make sure that we're striving to create our cities that are climate resilient, that are sustainable and livable, and at the same time it's going to help us be safe. Um, so that's why in my little presentation talk about collaboration and working together, that's why it's really important because the solution and the problem is not always what you think it is. Uh, we're going to have time for one more uh, question, um, and so, and then we'll just do some kind of closing remarks. Uh, how can we create a culture so that it is cool to drive slowly and to walk to school or work and to take transit? I'd like a couple answers to this one. How do we create the cool culture to drive slow if you need to drive, uh, otherwise you're walking, you're taking transit? I rode an e-bike to get here today. I was wearing this when I rode the e-bike. Well, I, then I took the SkyTrain. So maybe I would say, you know, you need to make sure that people are visible when they're doing this. And I hope that your leaders and leadership are also visible when they're doing it. So I'll just say the e-bikes help in wearing your work clothes or wearing your fancy clothes or putting your kids on the back and doing these things. So I think sort of creating a vision and pictures of different kinds of people getting around. I don't know how to make it cool to drive slow. I can't help you with this particular problem. But I think that keeping people visible, walking, cycling, and using transit, you know, really showing up as a leadership as a city, making sure that amongst the city that's promoted and supported, um, and, you know, including that in your emails and directions, the list goes on, right? So we know how to do that. But please, someone tell me how to make it cool to drive slow. I like this one. <laughs> well, this is, I don't know if this is, this is the, the only idea that comes to my mind right now, and it's probably a really bad one, but I'll share it anyway. Um, I was recently in Palm Springs, and, the, and I saw some very cool cats driving very slow, but they were in low riders with, <laughs> with suspensions, like shock suspensions, that they could bounce the car. So that was kind of cool to see. I'm not sure it would be super safe, um, but it was very cool. Um, it was very cool to see that. Um, but I, I think like the heart of this question is it's around change and culture and, and our communities and what's important to us, and that's always shifting um, and what our priorities are. Um, I think that's part of why I think we're here, to hear from folks and what they want their community to be. Um, yeah, slow streets is a big deal. And as, as, um, as you talked about with the, with the pandemic, you know, a lot of our cool streets, it was cool to be outside and sharing your streets and moving slow because it was a way to socialize. So 
I have hope that we can get there. Um, but anybody that knows me, I'm not very cool. I play with Lego, so um, I can't. I have to pass the mic. Um, okay. Well, maybe I, 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 I've just seen it's on like YouTube or something. I don't even know the city, but there's a, a younger gentleman, and I think it's really cool. He's got like speakers on his bike, and he's getting like school children. Uh, behind him and it's like making the whole idea there's like ideas of school buses and stuff like that or biking bus and anyway so I think th there's more for us to kind of uh, learn in the strategic transportation plan um, we'll have like a whole kind of section on like promotion and policy and things so thanks for bringing us uh, uh, around the, the cool culture that this SDP can have um, some just kind of final thoughts um, as, as as your moderator is like this has been great um, I think the panelists have helped kind of seed some thoughts on the possible solutions, strategies, things that we're going to need to be aware of. Again, uh, following this visioning phase, getting your input will then lead to a planning and implementation phase. And so, again, just leave tonight thinking about, wow, think in the longer future of Coquitlam, every second time I or my neighbor or my partner or my loved one is making a trip, it's actually by walk, bike and transit and just start thinking of that kind of um, transformation. Um, and then, you know, as you do that, uh, you know, again, thinking about the different kinds of ways that the streets are going to take shape in this kind of transformation, um, thinking again, you know, not just about commute trips, which are kind of governs a lot of types of our conversations, transportations, thinking about all the trips, and that's what the beauty, I think, of that household travel survey um, does for you. And so um, I would just like to say thank you to um, the panelists um, who have really, you know, seeded a, a bunch of different thoughts. Um, but with that, I'm going to pass it over to Doug to help um, you best understand how you can stay involved um, and continue um, in this engagement process. Thank you so much, Dale. Really appreciate that. And again, thank you so much, panelists. That was fantastic. Uh, very engaging discussion. Thank you for contributing. So um, what's next? So if you didn't see your question here answered tonight, um, we're going to stick around for a little bit to, uh, to answer any questions. I also encourage you, Payvan is at the back. She can give a little wave um, if you want to give your information and she can uh, help uh, if you take down your information and then we'll get back to you as well. Um, I think there was a lot of good questions on there, so I think one of the processes we might do is we may add some of the questions onto our website. So keep in touch and you'll see what's next. So moving forward, the, the, the strategic transportation plan is gonna start with launching even more engagements. You'll see more events around the city, including being at Canada Day, and it goes on until July. So please get yourself onto our website and I would give you some more um, questions, uh, uh, available information afterwards. But one last slide question we wanna ask you today is everything that you've heard and you learned today from the panelists, from uh, Glenn and Tom, now, where we need to go and how well do this proposed vision and goals resonate with you on a scale of one to five? So if we can go back to your Slido. I'm very happy to see that, that a lot of this helped resonate and inform you because again, that's the purpose of, a, of an event like this. So questions about the project. If you've got more questions, please go to the website, letstalkoquitlam.ca slash transportation plan. Register yourself. You can get informed. Email us at transportationplan at coquitlam.ca. Again, we, we want and need your input. That helps shape. You've heard from, from the panelists. You've heard from Tom and Glenn. Your input matters and helps us, helps us create that messaging to council and reflects the community's values on how to shape that transportation future because we're hearing loud and clear people want to walk more lots of you walked here people want to take transit people want a micro mobility but they also want to feel safe and how they get around so that's really important we need to continue that and hear from you about how might we do that just uh, we are on already on track to do some awesome things like our Guilford Way Greenway micro mobility project we're taking the existing on street bike lanes and separating them from traffic, again, helping it protect and make it feel safer. It's gonna be done in a few phases, right from the Port Moody border all the way over to the Coquitlam River Park. And don't worry, Port Moody is also planning on doing some stuff as well, so that way both communities are connected. Um, 
And as was mentioned by Sandra, there is a BC Electric bike rebate program. Again, you know, if you are interested, it starts tomorrow. Learn more information because we think the more people that register, the more people that oversubscribe to this program will place greater pressure on the province to redo it and expand it. And Colorado just did something very similar and it's like wildly successful.